are listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Habitat University. This podcast is your source for the science behind wildlife habitat management and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. We're your host, Jared Brook. And I'm Adam Janke, and we're both biologists and extension wildlife specialists. If you're interested in wildlife habitat management or looking for ways to improve your property for wildlife, this is the podcast for you. So join us as we talk with researchers, managers, and landowners all about the latest research and the ins and outs of wildlife habitat management. Welcome back to Habitat University. We're excited to have you. It's been a little while and what we're doing for the first time in our series is that we're doing a bonus episode. So uh, it's early December in the year 2021 and uh, Heretofore, we have always tried to make these episodes relatively timeless because we always thought like, well, the principles of habitat management are going to apply in 2025 in the same way they are in 2020 or 2021, whenever we, we were recording them. Uh, but this one, we thought, let's check in quick with our listeners. We're really excited to have completed season one, and we have some pretty exciting things in store for season two. And so we thought here quickly, a bonus episode around the holiday season to talk about some habitat stuff and the habitat holiday wish list to tell you a little bit, offer a teaser about what's coming in season two and uh, put something back in your feed since we've been gone for a little while. So Jared, do you wanna give us first the pitch on what we're up to or what we're planning for season two? Yeah, so season two, we're gonna launch right after the new year and that's gonna be a season all about private lands habitat management, right? So it's gonna talk all about different programs, both federal and state opportunities for landowners to you know, receive technical assistance and cost share assistance. We're going to talk with experts and conservationists throughout the U.S. Um, all about you know, who to reach out to, how you can find help, and how you can go about managing your property for whatever wildlife species you're interested in. So if you're a private landowner, this season's kind of for you, but it's also for you know, conservationists who deal with private lands management as well. Yeah, one of the things that I've been excited about in planning the episode is thinking about like, where are there species of wildlife that really depend on private lands, like almost exclusively, and we're going to visit some of those places, we're going to hopefully get out west and talk about sage grouse, get into the southeast and talk about some species down there, like maybe, well, of course, northern bobwhites, but maybe red cockaded woodpeckers and others. Uh, We hope to uh, talk to state agencies, federal agencies, private players like uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and then we also hope to get some private landowners on the, on the episode or on an episode as well, uh, to talk about what their experiences are with private lands, habitat management. So pretty exciting, uh, schedule that we're sort of putting together. We have a better plan for the things earlier in the year than we do later. Uh, and we're really excited to put that into your feed starting as Jared said, uh, around the first of the year. So that's going to be season two, but kind of in amongst those um episodes of the season we're gonna release some of these bonus episodes and this is the first example of that bonus episode right so they're gonna be kind of shorter episodes uh where we hit on more timely topics and things that are going on in the habitat management and conservation world so we could just get it going what we thought what better topic for a bonus episode in december of 2021 then to think about a holiday wish list. And we love alliteration on the podcast. And so a habitat holiday wish list is what we're up to today. Uh, Jared and I both came, uh, haven't disclosed to one another what our habitat holiday wish lists are. Uh, and we're gonna disclose those to you one by one and kind of get you thinking about things that you could be buying for your favorite lover of habitat in your life, or you could be putting on your own holiday wish list uh, as that time of year comes around. So, uh, Jared, do you want to get us started with your first habitat holiday wish list item? So, the first one that I have on my list is one that I actually got recently and have been using more and more and have been finding more and more applications for in 
um, the field of habitat management, and that's a drone or a UAV. And I think, you know, these are becoming more commercially available. It's easier to find on the, you know, you know public market. About anyone can go buy these. Um, and they're becoming cheaper, so they're more reasonably priced. You know, you can get drones anywhere from hundred dollars up to a thousand, you know, thousands of dollars, depending on what capabilities you want. But I think they're, it's becoming quite clear that they have pretty big utility in habitat management and a lot of things that we might use it for, you know, and from a landowner's perspective, um, more than just getting pretty pictures of your property from the air, which can be exciting as well to kind of keep track of progress over time, but there's all kinds of applications from the habitat side. So the, the, what, the things I've been using them for most recently is uh, especially invasive species monitoring and control efforts. So this time of year in Indiana is a really good time of year to fly a woodlot. And you can see exactly where invasive species like autumn olive and bush honeysuckle are because they're the only thing green in the woods right now. So you can really keep track of where the pockets of invasives are. And then also in fields, right? So I use them all the time to scout old fields and prairie plantings and stuff, looking for things like cool season grasses, especially reed canary grass and wetlands. Because that those pockets of reed canary grass this time of year and into the spring really pop, you know, being the only green thing that you might find out there right now. Um, so really good from an invasive species standpoint, but there's... Yeah, I really like that idea. It's... Um the tracking invasives one is a really good thought. Another species that we'd add to the list out here in Iowa would be European buckthorn is also green late into the year. And if, if you could find that and then uh, plan your, your control efforts over the winter, that's going to really advantage your land management. So that's an awesome idea. Um, and as you said, they are pretty accessible. There's lots of research applications for drones, but we do find, you know, you can buy these things at Best Buy, uh, you can buy them pretty affordably online. It could be a really useful tool to save you a lot of walking across the prairie or walking through the timber uh, and be really strategic in your habitat management. So that's a yeah, good one. And I, and I think another awesome application for drones from a landowner's perspective is if you are actively doing habitat management on your property, you can track the progress through time. You know, where if, if you're using satellite imagery, that's updated every two, three years, in most cases, maybe a little bit longer and in, in, in some areas are shorter. But with a drone, you can get up and you can fly and you can take pictures of what the area looks like before you do any habitat management, what it looks like immediately after, what it looks like six months, you know, a year, 18 months, however, whatever frequency you want to take pictures. And you can really watch the progress of, of uh, those, those habitat management. Uh, techniques. And the last application that we use it for a lot is around prescribed fire. So it's really good to monitor a prescribed fire from the air to be able to see, you know, where your smoke's going, where you might have spot fires if it happens to get out, but also kind of tracking what areas burn and what areas don't burn after a fire. So lots of good habitat management applications. Cool. I really like that one. We should mention that you know, rules abound and different municipalities and everything else. And, uh, but for the most part, if you're just doing this for a hobby, you can buy a drone and keep it under 400 feet and fly pretty safely as long as you're not close to an airport. So make sure to check your local, you know, restrictions and state policies regarding flying a drone. But if you have private land, you probably can get away with a lot and have a lot of fun with it. So, okay. So my first, um, habitat ho holiday habitat wish list idea was was a broad one but uh native plants and that won't come as a surprise to any of the listeners because we like to celebrate uh native plants and the opportunity we get here on the podcast but to be a little bit more specific i thought um you know a cool thing that i like to try to do in my holiday shopping is to support you know local small businesses or uh, local industries and one thing that's really important when we think about wildlife habitat management is um local production of native seed sources and nursery stock for a couple of reasons. We talked one in the invasive species episode in season one, all about the challenges that exotic plant introductions and, and moving plants around the country create with fungal pathogens or invasive plants. Uh, sticking to local native species is going to ensure that we reduce the probability that those kind of things happen. And then two, it supports these local businesses. So here in Iowa, one that I would, you know, 
encourage people to use is the state forest nursery, which is this amazing state resource that we have that produces these um, really hardy native tree seedlings. Um, other states, I know Indiana has the same and other states have comparable systems that you could seek out and support uh, for your favorite lover of habitat on your holiday, uh, holiday shopping list. Uh, or you could look online and find native seed dealers. You know, here in the prairie states, we put a lot of native prairie seed on the ground and lots of uh, nurseries uh, and uh, seed producers uh, have deals this time of year where you can buy your seed. And then as we say in prairie reconstruction, plant it the way mother nature does, throw it on top of the snow in February and let it work into the ground through a couple of freeze thaw cycles and you'll have uh, prairie in a site, you know, that's properly prepared. Uh, next year. So, um, yeah, my number one is native plants, exclamation mark. And I like that one too, because I think that one can run the gamut of if you're managing wildlife habitat in your backyard, all the way to if you're managing it on thousands of acres, right? Yep. So you can bring habitat home and, and plant some of these native trees and shrubs or native prairie plants in your own landscape in your backyard. And you can kind of get a twofer if you, uh, you know, you can either buy your seed through a seed dealer or there's a variety of conservation organizations like Quell Forever or Pheasants Forever that sell native seed. So you're kind of benefiting them, but also benefiting those seed dealers as well. Yeah, you bet. All right. So um, sticking with the theme of plants, I'm going to take kind of the opposite of what you just said and in, in buying native plants. And I'm going to take my second item is going to be some sort of tool to get rid of invasive plants right and the thing i have on my list is a backpack sprayer and and or a honeysuckle puller so those tools that you can see that you can you know pull up honeysuckle bushes and things especially if you have small property and small um, shrubs and buckthorn and things as well those pullers can be a really good way if you don't want to use herbicide but probably describe the Describe a honeysuckle puller to to me and the rest of the listeners that I suppose suppose have the same confused look on their face that I do. Yeah, so they're sold under a, nu a number of names. Oftentimes they're called like weed wrenches and things. But okay. there's this long um, device with a handle that essentially grasps onto the bottom of the bush, and then you use leverage. So you pull it down, and the leverage that's created basically uproots. The, huh. the shrubs and so things like honeysuckle have really shallow roots yeah so they're pretty easy to pull out um which can be a good way to to get rid of honeysuckle of your wood in your woods so you can use those honeysuckle pullers and they work for buckthorn and autumn olive and and other things as well hmm, i like that one but i'd say one on my list yeah and I, I actually just bought one uh oh, for okay. my christmas list as well so <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> uh but beyond that i think uh a backpack sprayer is probably, I would probably put a backpack sprayer ahead of a honeysuckle puller just because you have such a wide range of applications for a backpack puller or backpack sprayer, right? So a honeysuckle puller is good for shrubs, but a backpack sprayer, if you're controlling invasives, you can control invasive trees, you know, shrubs, grasses, you know, forbs, all kinds of invasives. So um, a backpack sprayer is a good one. And of course, always making sure that you have the proper PPE to go with that backpack sprayer. So gloves, glasses, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that would be a nice like themed holiday gift. You could get someone the backpack sprayer and all the appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE. Yeah. And if you're, uh, if you're looking for another gift idea goes with that, buy them some herbicide too. Right. So, Oh, there's the ultimate package. Oh, wow. I want you, I want you to Christmas shop for me, Jared. That sounds awfully fun. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so I'm going to go now on my second one on the th sticking with the plants theme won't surprise the listeners if you've listened to season one. Uh, my uh, number one is a field guide or my number two is a field guide in, you know, any field guide will do uh, anything that helps you sort of interpret uh, the natural resources on land that you own or spend a lot of time on uh, will be good. But one that I'll offer as a recommendation is one that Jared and I both learned in our undergraduate training at Purdue called the Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. This is a classic field guide uh, for at least people in the eastern United States. It was originally written primarily for the northeastern United States, but I've lived west of the Mississippi for 11 years now and found that at least out here, 
in Iowa and in South Dakota, it captures a majority of the plants, particularly woodland plants that we find. And the really innovative and cool thing about the Newcomb's Guide is that it has these three simple questions that you answer at the beginning to get you going down the road to identifying herbaceous, primarily herbaceous, some woody, but primarily herbaceous plants uh, based on the, um, the flower type, the plant type, uh, and the leaf type. And so if you answer these three questions and then you go to answer a few more questions and off you go, as long as you have a flower, you can almost always key this thing out. And it's just, I'm holding my copy here as we record it. Uh, and it's just torn and tattered. It's sat on, you know, with, uh, the dashboard of a million different pickup trucks throughout the years and, and been a really useful uh, companion for me back in the timber to identify herbaceous plants. So if, Generally, you can't go wrong getting someone a field guide and there's field guides for all the things, butterflies, and reptiles, amphibians and birds and woody plants and aquatic plants. I mean, we could just go on and on. Uh, and then to be a little bit more specific, I really suggest, especially if you're in the eastern United States, this Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. So, Adam, you just opened a can of worms. I had about... <laughs> 10 different plan uh -oh. ID books on my list. Oh, okay. So do, do we want to like rattle some off? Or? Yeah, uh, I okay. think, do you have a, do you have, is, is this going to be like your number three? It, well, I can use those, my number three, but I figured since you already took ID books, I just let everyone know my favorites okay. as well. Let them rip. All right. So I have, uh, th these are, you know, again, kind of biased towards the Midwest, but um, native trees of the Midwest and Shrubs and Vines of Indiana and the Midwest, which are both written by um, professors here at Purdue. And those are really good because not only do they give you identification um, information, they also give you wildlife value and landscaping uses. So uh, pretty good yeah, ones Those there. are two of my favorites too. Yeah. Um, wildflowers and Ferns of Indiana Forests. That's another one, kind of Indiana Midwest specific. Um, here's some one, a couple from my Southeastern um, for, for my Southeastern friends, but forest plants of the Southeast and their wildlife uses is an awesome resource. Um, if you're really across the Eastern U S but mainly the Southeast U S. Um, and if, if you're in more agricultural areas, weeds of the Midwest is a really good one for agricultural weeds, but also they have, you know, weeds of the South weeds of the West. They have lots of different weeds of these books. And of course I had Newcomb's wildflower guide as well. Okay. And one more for your, for the wetland folks, Adam, you may be familiar with this book, but a guide to moist soil wetland plants of the Mississippi alluvial Valley. Okay. It's a really good one. I have seen that one. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. So you just, you just knocked a bunch off my list. Cool. So did I use that as my third one or did I get a, a third? You could do your third one. Okay. <laughs> So my third one is more of an experience, a learning experience than it is necessarily an item or a book. And so my fourth or third one, sorry, is some sort of online or in-person habitat management course. Okay. Um, and a couple that I had that I picked up were um, usually your university extension um, wildlife specialist or other, other extension group in the state will have some sort of training throughout the year. Now, the difficulty with that one is it's going to be hard to, most of them aren't open to register around Christmas, but you can give uh, an IOU gift and say, I'm going to enroll yeah, you in this idea. course yeah. um, for the future. Right. And so I know you do a program called master conservationist. We in Indiana, we have a, a woodland owner short course. that can be really good. Um, different States also have some online programs. So I'd encourage folks to, visit their um, university extension website, whatever their land grant university is, and look for some of those courses online or in person. A couple other ones, and this, this next one's free, but you don't have to tell the person that you're giving to that it's free. Um, and that's the Introduction to Southeastern Prescribed Fire, which is through um, campus.extension.org. It's a free Introduction to Prescribed Fire class, which can be really good for those folks that are interested in using prescribed fire on their land. And again, free, but you don't have to tell people it's free. I really like that idea, Jared. That's a good, keeping with our commitment to lifelong learning and extension, the uh, roles that we occupy at our universities, I think that's a good idea. And yeah, opportunities do abound. 
uh, for these sorts of things. And I liked your idea of like making it an IOU. If you've got a family member, a, a son or daughter or mom or dad or grandpa or grandma that are really interested in land management and want to spend time with you, then maybe that's what you could stick in their stocking this year, uh, a promise to take off to a forestry field day uh, that uh, university or a wildlife or forestry resource agency in a state is offering uh, or enrolling in a course like that. I think that's a really good idea. And also beyond, you know, university extension and, you know, resource agencies, look at um, NGOs as well. So conservation organizations, one really good one that you can do online and you can register for, for right now. And that I've been through is uh, especially for those folks that are really into wildlife or into whitetail deer management is the Deer Steward One course through the National Deer Alliance, which is kind of as close to a college class about white-tailed deer that you can get without actually enrolling in a university. So it's a really good class that is going to give you information about deer biology, um, all the way through, you know, all the way up to habitat management for for deer specifically, but also touches on some other wildlife species as well. Well, that's a that's pretty cool, and I didn't know about that NDA class, so I'll definitely have to check that out myself. They, they also have in-person ones as well. So, cool. Okay. Well, so my third one on my list is uh, kind of also not necessarily something you buy. This idea was something that you could make. Uh, lots of things that you could make that uh, you know sort of enhance your experiences in in nature or. Um, also can provide wildlife habitat. And so just broadly, I thought woodworking for wildlife as a theme, and I actually have some resources on my own website and a lot of agencies have resources on uh, their websites with different patterns and designs. You could build uh, all sorts of structures for wildlife, um, wood duck boxes, uh, boxes for ducks that may attract like buffalo heads or hooded mergansers in some parts of the country. Um, you could build bluebird boxes, wren boxes, platforms for like robins and uh, other platform nesting birds. Um, American kestrels are a species that are, um, you know, cavity dependent and on the decline across North America. And there's some really neat plans out there for American kestrel boxes, um, bat houses. There's like all sorts of ideas of things. Pollinator or bee, wood boring bee. Yeah. Houses. Bee, bee boxes. There's all sorts of ideas. The one our the assignment here was to be really specific. And so my really, so I just riffed on a bunch of woodworking designs that you've got time before the holiday season starts in earnest, uh, that you could, you could work on. But the one specific one that I was going to suggest is the Aldo Leopold bench. I thought, you know, we did spend six episodes of the first season of Habitat University talking about uh, Mr. Leopold's work and, and writing uh, and how it inspires habitat management. And he's pretty widely credited with this like really simple design for a bench that you can make out of a couple of, um, oh, I think it's like two by tens and a two by 12 for the seat. Uh, stuff that's really easily available, Cut, like really simple tools, uh, a couple of carriage bolts, and you've got a bench that's pretty hardy and you could stick out uh, in your favorite place in nature. And what happens when you stick a bench in your favorite place in nature, you sit down and you learn about it and you're going to be a better habitat manager for having sat there and uh, studied uh, the, an the plants and animals throughout the year, throughout the day. So I was going to suggest specifically uh, build a Leopold bench for yourself, for your loved ones. Uh, tell them the story of Aldo Leopold's writing and, and work uh, and maybe how you heard about it here on Habitat University and um, enjoy your time there. Awesome. I like that idea. I, I, I may actually add that to my list for what I'm going to do this winter. It's a nice winter word working project, right? It's a so. perfect, it's a perfect winter project. If you don't yeah. get it in by the end of the year. Perfect. All right. So my fourth one, um, is goes along with more of a, more back to equipment. So things that you would need to actually perform habitat management. And I'm going to combine a couple here, Adam, just so we can get them, but I'm just going to be, PPE. And okay. when I say PPE, it's personal protective equipment or personal protection equipment. And I think there's, there's two kinds of equipment that are really, really important to have. Um, if you're going to be involved in habitat management, that's chainsaw PPE. So make sure that you have chaps, a helmet, eye coverings and gloves and things like that, which you can buy from lots of different websites. 
So that'd be, you know, if, if you have someone that likes to use a chainsaw and they don't have PPE, get them some PPE just to be safe. You know, we always recommend, I, I don't use a chainsaw without wearing PPE. And the second one along the lines of PPE is uh, prescribed fire PPE. So that'd be like Nomex clothing. And this one's going to be a little bit more expensive, um, but you're going to, it's going to be worth it if you do a lot of fire, right? So there's going to be things like Nomex clothes. You can buy those Nomex jumpsuits, but things that's going to be kind of fire retardant clothing, not something that you have to have to use prescribed fire, but if you're going to, if you're going to use it year after year, you might as well invest in the proper gear and proper clothing. Cool. I think that's a really good suggestion uh, and, a, and a really good idea to get the people that you love to tell them you care about them. You're really glad they have that passion for habitat management and you want them to stay safe while they're doing it uh, and so that they can continue to steward their resources on their land or land they have influence over. So that's a really good idea, Jared. Okay, so my next one, my number four, is a trail camera that syncs with your phone. Or I don't know exactly what these things are called, but cell, I just cell phone, cell, cell Wire, phone wireless, or yeah, yeah, cell phone trail cameras. And so here's here's the reason. This is especially for people like you and me that drive a desk for a living, uh, that spend a lot of time behind the computer on Zoom calls or sending emails, and not necessarily out where we really want to be. Uh, amongst the the wild things in the wild places. I have just derived a huge amount of joy and pleasure from my cell phone camp trail camera thing. Uh, it just feels like almost like a healthy social media type of thing. Like it's like if I grab my phone during the fall and winter when I have my cameras out, it is not to look at Twitter. It's not to look at Facebook or get mad at a news article. It is to look at, in my case, the scrapes I have my cameras on. And I just have a lot of fun with it. And I think, um, especially for people that don't get to spend as much time out there as you know, maybe we wish we could, uh, putting these things up on land the owner have influence over could be just a really fun way to learn more about that land throughout the year. And so you could put them on badger dens, you could put them on uh, coyote or fox dens, you could put them on like a slide where a beaver or river otters coming and going uh and you could or you could put them on just game trails uh there's just a lot of opportunities that you could use a trail camera and learn a lot about your land uh what's coming and going and what their activity patterns and who's there and who's not uh from these things and i just think having it connected to your cell phone makes it a little extra fun it kind of makes you feel a little more connected to the land uh even when you can't physically be there so when you're on a zoom call and your video is off you're not scrolling Facebook, you're scrolling the I'm pictures. Absolutely, are in. absolutely looking at my app. So I'm not going to necessarily endorse one or the other. I frankly haven't done a lot of research on it, but if you look online, you'll find all sorts of articles and opinions on what works. My experience is I just got one that has the same provider as my cell phone. And so then it just makes it easier to know if it's going to have good reception while I'm out there. I just look at my phone, set it up, make sure it's working and off we go. They're relatively affordable too. I would have thought they would have been, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars and they're not, it's 10 bucks a month or something. And, um, a little under 200 bucks for the camera itself. So this could be a really fun way to learn more about your land. If you don't want the cell phone ones, get trail cameras because trail cameras are just a really fun way to learn uh, about your land throughout the year too. Great. So my number five, my last one, I'm going to stick with prescribed fire and I'm going to say that, uh, a good, gift for any prescribed fire aficionado is going to be a drip torch. Oh, that's Re a good one. Relatively yeah. inexpensive, you know, maybe a hundred, 125 bucks, yeah. but well worth it. Um, I've seen some pretty archaic ways of starting prescribed yeah. fires in my day and just skip all that stuff. And it's just easier to, to buy yourself or, or get someone a drip torch. And it's a lot safer than some of those ways. Um, and it's a lot easier and it's going to last you a long time. So if you're going to be using prescribed fire, might as well invest in a drip torch, right? I was thinking that actually when you were talking about your PPE thing, I was like, oh, we should have set a drip torch. That would have been a really fun one. So here we go again with a package deal. Uh, get your loved one a drip torch uh, and then the PPE, the Nomex clothing that Jared mentioned earlier uh, to go along with it. That would be a pretty sweet. You got to make sure deal. they open the PPE first before they open the drip torch. That way they 
they know to wear that when they get the drip torch. Make the expectations really clear. We want to keep all these habitat managers healthy and safe out there. Okay, so my last one as we start to wrap up here, um, I just put good books. I'm going to give you one specifically, but I think I could kind of like riff on a bunch. I This is just stuff that I've read you know, recently, things that I've been thinking about. Um, I finished this book called Coyote America uh, earlier this year that I really enjoyed. One called Eager about beavers. That was a really fun uh, read about wildlife. Uh, there's this book called The Home Place by Dr. Drew Lanham uh, out of Clemson. And it's just an absolutely beautiful memoir uh, and really good book. Uh, but the one that I'm going to recommend, the number one book that I think um, has really had me thinking um, for a little over a year now since I finished it, uh, and I think you'd actually see it reflected in some of the work that we've done on the podcast, is this book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And Robin Wall Kimmerer is a professor at a university in New York. Uh, and so she's trained in like this, what we would say, like Western science, like kind of the um, traditional or, the, well, university science hypothesis driven science but she also uh is a native american woman and so she's uh trained in sort of this native american way of thinking and her cultural traditions that she was raised in um the subtitle of the book is called indigenous wisdom scientific knowledge in the teaching of plants and she just absolutely beautifully weaves this these kind of two ways of thinking together and uh instills in the reader a passion for land and land stewardship um, akin to what you know reading Aldo Leopold does for a lot of people as well I kind of think of Robin Wall Kimmerer's voice as sort of our modern uh, equivalent uh, just absolute beautiful writing about environmental stewardship caring about the land and um, and stewarding it for generations to come the types of stuff we talk about on Habitat University so uh, if I was to tell you to buy one book uh, for your loved one or for yourself this holiday season, uh, it would be Braiding Sweetgrass and then all those other ones that I suggested as well. Uh, you couldn't go wrong with. It's it's sitting on my nightstand right now. It's my next read. It's a really good one. Yeah. So I think, you know, Adam, to save the listeners some time, I think we, we're going to have to do a whole episode about just good books for conservationists and habitat managers. I could, I could write off my, my list right now, but let's save that for later. Okay. We, yeah, we need to do another Christmas one next year. Right. So, okay. That sounds good. So that wraps up our show for this, this episode, folks. Again, this is just a bonus episode. We hope you had a little fun with it. We're going to put all of these recommendations and some links down in the show notes. We're going to have a pretty thorough show notes this go around uh, just so you could take advantage of this kind of stuff and find uh, what we're recommending. We'd love, as always, for you to like and subscribe to the podcast, fill out our listener survey, especially if you think uh, we missed one or hit us up on Twitter uh, if you think we missed a good uh, Habitat holiday wish list item. And we're really looking forward to having you back in season two coming in January of 2022. Habitat University is hosted by Purdue Extension and Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. The network is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Habitat University, subscribe and listen to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. Iowa State University and Purdue University are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions.